Welcome to the University of Illinois Extension's Local Government Education Webinar. I first want to mention that we will be muting your phones during the presentation. However, please feel free to put questions in the chat box. If we don't have time to cover all the questions at the end of the session, Dr. Redfield indicates that I can send you through via email um, his email address and he will address those questions after the uh, webinar. Also, we will be putting a link to a survey in the chat box just before the end of the session and you will also receive an email regarding the survey just after the close of today's webinar. We would appreciate it if you would take a couple of minutes to complete that survey. Our committee is in the process of creating the next series of webinars and your input on what topics you would like to hear about would be very useful to us. Now, today's webinar. Dr. Kent Redfield will be presenting Illinois Local Government, How Do, we make, how do You Make Essential Services More Effective and Efficient? Dr. Redfield is Professor Emeritus of Political Studies at the University of Illinois Springfield, UIS, he has research appointments with the Center for State Policy and Leadership at UIS and the University of Illinois Institute of Government and Public Affairs. Prior to joining UIS in 1979, Dr. Redfield worked for four years as a member of the research appropriations staff for the Speaker of the Illinois General Assembly. His primary assignment was with the legislature was staffing the House's local government committees. In addition to his local government background in the legislature, Dr. Redfield has conducted research and published reports for the Taxpayers Federation of Illinois on tax increment financing, a conducted research and public report, published reports on the Illinois Enterprise Zone Program for the Institute for Public Affairs, now the Center for State and Policy and Leadership at the University of Illinois Springfield. Dr. Redfield served as a member of the Sagamon County Citizens Efficiency Commission, which was created by a countywide referendum in November 2010. The commission studied the structure and performance of local government units in Sagamon County and recommended a series of reforms and initiatives aimed at improving the effectiveness and efficiency of the services that local governments provide to the citizens of Sagamon County. Dr. Redfield continues to be one of the leading authorities on politics and government in the state. Now we will have Dr. Redfield take over the presentation. Uh, Dr. Redfield, go ahead and take over the presentation. Ah, good afternoon. Um, so, uh, we're going to talk about uh, how do you make essential services more efficient and effective in terms of local government in Illinois. Uh, there's a quote there on that first uh, slide. Uh, if you were starting from scratch, no one would consci consciously design a system of local government like the one that's evolved over the years in Illinois. And so if you, if you look at uh, the way we do local government in Illinois and you find it uh, confusing or frustrating or uh, goofy, uh, you're not missing anything. Uh, this is a, a very complex uh, system of local government. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what it is, how we got here, and then talk about what the, you know, what that means for trying to make uh, uh, changes. Uh, and uh, with an, with an eye towards both uh, the cost of local government, but also the effectiveness of local government, and and so it is it is a, a problem of or a, a you know you need to consider both uh, you know what we are doing in terms of spending money, but you also need to consider you know local government from the perspective of the services being being performed. Um, there are more units of local government in Illinois than any other state. Uh, Counting the number is uh, difficult uh, because uh, some of them uh, levy property taxes, some of them do not, some of them are administrative or kind of paper districts, uh, some of them spend uh, state money or federal money without any local money. Uh, the Department of Revenue uh, tracks uh, 
property tax levies, and so they identify about 5,100 units of local government uh, which uh, levy property taxes. Now, there are also uh, uh, school districts and community college districts that make up the total of those numbers, and in some cases it's useful to look at uh, both uh, school districts and units of local government in terms of asking questions about uh, how they're being managed, how they're being organized, how do we evaluate them. But uh, from my perspective, you know, looking at local government separately uh, is, is uh, I think, a, a more useful way to, to, to kind of drill down in terms of you know, what's going on in, in a particular area or in terms of a particular set of services. There are significant differences in the way that we fund local governments as opposed to school districts, and there are significant differences in the nature of the services they, they provide. Uh, you know, so for example, uh, everybody benefits directly from uh, roads. Uh, 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 either even if you don't drive, uh, you know, other people are 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 doing things for you that involve them driving on roads. Uh, on the other hand, uh, schools are something that uh, the direct benefit in terms of having children in a school system, being a parent of a school system, uh, is much more limited, even in terms of, you know, being an employer as a byproduct of the school system. Uh, the way we look at schools from the state level, you know, we have a state uh, board of, it, uh, of uh, education. Uh, we have uh, some general consensus about metrics and uh, common goals. Uh, local government is much more fragmented and we really don't address it uh, at the state level uh, in terms of any kind of systematic way. Uh, you know, the, the, the Lieutenant Governor's uh, Commission on uh, our task force on consolidation and unfunded mandates uh, is the latest example of trying to kind of get a handle on all of this from the state level. Uh, but we really, you know, we can come back to it, but we really haven't uh, addressed local government from a state perspective since we abolished the Department of Local Government Affairs uh, in, in, in the mid-70s, which represented when that existed as an attempt to kind of give a state-level focus to what was going on at the... Uh, at the local level. Uh, it is certainly about money when we look at uh, local governments, particularly as they relate to property taxes. Uh, local government school districts levied uh, almost $28 billion worth of property taxes in 2014. Uh, and uh, just to put that into perspective, uh, in that same year, uh, the state of Illinois collected about $23 billion worth of corporate and individual uh, income tax and uh, about $8.5 billion worth of sales tax. So the amount of property taxes that are being collected and expended uh, at a local level in Illinois exceed the amount of income tax that is being uh, being. Uh, collected and and uh, expended at the the state level, uh, units of local government account for 44 uh, percent of those property taxes, about 10 billion dollars, uh, which again would leave uh, you know uh, uh, the majority of that uh, being on the education side. And if you look at that short list there, uh, you know. These are the general units of local government, municipalities, counties, townships. You have park districts and forest preserve districts, sanitary districts, library districts. So, uh, you know, the bulk of those are going to uh, services that uh, are understandable and, and very visible to, to most citizens. Uh, but there is another $731 million worth of property taxes in, in special districts. Okay. 
So it's about money, but it's also about more than money. Uh, this is essential services and protections to citizens at the most basic and direct level. I mean, just call the roll. Police, fire, public health, transportation, zoning, medical services, sanitation, sewers, uh, emergency medical services, parks and recreations, uh, you know, libraries. These are things that need to be provided. These are the things that uh, speak to the quality of life of individuals in their local communities. The challenge is how do you meet those basic needs? How do you do them in the most effective and efficient way possible? And uh, you know, you can always come at it from the perspective we have X amount of money. Uh, you know, how can we end up? Uh, how can or how can we spend less money? But it's really a at least from my experience in, in, in working with the Citizens Efficiency Commission in Sangamon County, you have to ask questions about both, uh, you know, what are you doing, uh, what, what, are, what is actually being accomplished out there, and then, you know, what is it costing, and uh, not only are there better ways to, and more efficient ways to do what you're doing, but are, th are there things that need to be doing, are there un that you need to be doing, are there unmet uh, needs out there. Just as a general statement, both as someone who's you know been involved with local government in Illinois and someone who has a background in in looking at at this from a comparative state perspective, you know this is a very fragmented and complex system. Uh, it has an impact on uh, the way services are delivered. It has an impact on citizens in terms of their ability to understand, uh, you know, who's providing services, uh, who's in charge, who do I complain to uh, when, th when things go don't get done. Uh, in my county, there are uh, 95 units of local government that levy property taxes in addition to the school districts and community colleges. Um, you know, those are 26 municipalities, 26 townships, fire protection districts, library districts, park districts, sanitary district, auditorium authority, mass transit, uh, and multi-township uh, assessment districts. We have the only auditorium authority in Illinois that levies a, uh, a property tax and has an elected a board uh, to manage that auditorium uh, authority. Uh, some of those districts are run by officials and boards elected countywide. Some are run by boards and officials elected within the district. Some are run by boards appointed by county officials. Um, some of them are coterminous. Uh, uh, you know, it's Springfield has a library district. Uh, which is essentially run by uh, the city council and the mayor, but it's a separate corporate entity under the law. It's a local library unit, actually, as opposed to uh, the major library district in the county is is around the city of the city of Chatham. And then we have services that are provided under the supervision of of people that are elected separately, uh, countywide services. Uh, almost everybody has a county coroner, for example, that provides a service uh, that, and they are elected separately from the county board. Uh, and you know, uh, a more common example, county sheriff. So this is, you know, a, a very complex system. Uh, there are 11 separate taxing districts on my. Uh, 2005 uh, tax bill, uh, which I was looking at the other day, and uh, just you know, to go back to an earlier point, uh, I live in the city of Springfield, but I'm in the Rochester School District. Uh, my kids are, uh, my children have all graduated from high school. I have a daughter that works for District 186. I have a son-in-law that works for 186. They're both teachers, uh, but the biggest part of my taxes go to, uh, the biggest portion of my tax bill is to pay uh, taxes to the Rochester uh, School District. Uh, you know, schools are a different kind of a, 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 
a, a policy problem in turn when you're trying to think about uh, uh, you know their relationship that they have to citizens. Um, okay, that's kind of where we are. Uh, let's take a minute and talk about how did we get here. Uh, for a hundred years, the Illinois uh, state of Illinois operated under the 1870 Constitution. Uh, that Constitution uh, came about uh, as we were moving, starting to move from a uh, basically rural state to an urban state. Uh, if you look at the populations of the state in 1870, the city of Chicago had 300,000 people. The next five biggest cities in Illinois currently, uh, you know, Springfield had 17,000 people, Peoria had 23, Aurora had 11,000, Rockford had 10,000, Joliet had seven. And so, you know, when the 1870 Constitution was written and incorporated most of the 1848 Constitution, we were looking at how do you provide, you know, municipal services for a state in which the vast majority of the territory and the population was rural. And the 1848 Constitution uh, set up uh, you know, the idea of township government, uh, which was essentially congressional townships, which were a way of plotting or, uh, you know, doing geographical surveys in terms of the state. And it was adopted as a system of government that was uh, not a municipality and was smaller than a county in terms of uh, doing some general services. Uh, those exist in uh, you know, there are 27 counties that uh, don't have never had, don't have township uh, government. Those all are in the the the, uh, the southern part of the state. You know, this was how we were going to organize government and provide municipal services uh, during, uh, you know, from the 1850s to, you know, to 1870. And so, uh, you know, that's a feature that exists in Illinois in a very different way uh, than most other states. Uh, even when you have township government in the uh, uh, northeast, you're talking about something that is much closer to a municipality than what we're talking about in terms of the structure in, uh, in Illinois. Uh, the... 1870 Constitution uh, had a number of features that uh, had an impact on how we organized local government. There was a prohibition on non-uniform levying of property taxes within a district. You could not have special service areas. You know, the the the, the whipping boy of local government, when you, we talk about local government in Illinois, uh, we always bring up the mosquito abatement district. Uh, we could add the streetlight district. You know, why in the world would you do that? Well, if you are sitting in a county and you've got a small area that has a problem with mosquitoes, you've got two options under the 1870 Constitution. You can levy a countywide tax and then provide the service to that area, or you could set up a special district uh, with a particular set of boundaries that would levy property taxes to provide services to that district. And so you didn't have the option of doing a special service area. Uh, the, the 1870 Constitution had very low limits on the amount of debt that a local government unit could incur and very strict and low limits on county property taxes. You couldn't just amend the state statute and change uh, the property tax limits for counties. That meant that counties did not develop into the, uh, the way they had did in many other states to provide municipal services. You know, in lots of other states, you have counties that basically provide a wide range of municipal services to 
uh, to unincorporated areas. Uh, that that never developed in Illinois. It didn't. It develop. It did not develop because of the limits on property taxes. Uh, it also uh, the limits on debt meant that. Uh, if you were a municipality and you wanted to uh, develop uh, parkland, uh, you wanted to build a library, and uh, you were at your debt limit, uh, then the way to get around that was to create a, a separate unit of local government that could borrow money uh, and make uh, some kind of capital uh, uh, expenditure. Uh, you know, so we didn't get, uh, you know, we didn't get county fire departments, we didn't get county uh, libraries, uh, uh, and uh, when municipalities and corporate areas were up against debt limits, then you got uh, uh, separate units of local government. So uh, there were things that were set in place in the 1870 Constitution that made it very difficult to to uh, uh, use the county as a vehicle for providing municipal services. Uh, and then you you always have a desire for uh, for local control. Uh, uh, you know, you, you know, not having county government uh, as kind of the mega government in terms of municipal services. Uh, you know that certainly, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, later. But uh, you know, uh, while there are some advantages in terms of economies of scale, in terms of counties providing uh, services, uh, it is something that flies in the face of local communities wanting to have a mix of services that fit their particular. Uh, uh, the needs of their citizens, and and so uh, you just didn't get in Illinois the kinds of things that you got in other states. Uh, Seattle, where I went to graduate school, you know, basically in King County, which is where Seattle is, you have uh, a uh, uh, a uh, you have municipal governments and you have county government. And you have a few regional uh, entities dealing with things like transportation or water. I mean, it's a very clean system. Uh, in parts of California, uh, you have uh, municipalities which uh, uh, are either receiving a basic level of services from the county or are purchasing units of police or fire protection uh, from county government. Uh, and so uh, kind of a think of it as a municipal service market kind of model, uh, uh, a different way of going about uh, you know, providing services, uh, getting the economies of scale from uh, the county providing services, but getting local control by allowing uh, you know, essentially, you know, municipalities to purchase uh, certain levels of services from uh, from the the, the counties uh, as a provider of services. There are just lots of different ways uh, that you could go about, or you know, think about uh, uh, how do you provide services? How do you make the trade-offs between uh, economies of scale, between uh, meeting certain standards, and the desire for local uh, local control, but uh, uh, those kinds of innovations or those opportunities were largely uh, restricted by uh, or, or made impossible by the 1870 Constitution. In addition, you had limits on local government uh, intergovernmental agreements uh, in terms of both the language in the Constitution and the way it was interpreted. In general, if you look at the at Illinois prior to the 1970 Constitution, it's a pretty typical uh, state constitution where local governments are creatures of the state. They have very, very limited uh, autonomy. And so uh, what happened in Illinois is a response. I'm not saying it's the best or the only response, but it was a response to the limitations that were faced uh, by citizens in local communities uh, when they looked at 
uh, you know, how do we get the basic services that we need? Police, fire, we want to have libraries, we want to have parks and recreation, we want to have uh, water, we want to control our zoning, and, uh, you know, uh, how do you go about that in terms of, uh, you know, are there options other than doing it a county-wide basis, doing it as a municipality, what about things that uh, areas of concern that don't fit uh, uh, the boundaries, you know, that are uh, bigger than a municipality, smaller than a than a county, uh, sanitary districts, water, you know, watersheds. Uh, those are kinds of things that not only uh, uh, you know sometimes don't fit county boundaries or municipal boundaries, but they can be uh, multi-county kinds of kinds of problems. So you get you got a system of local government that grew up, uh, you know, trying to, you know, come to, to get your basic services within the options that were available. Uh, we got awfully creative in terms of the way that we went about uh, setting up units of local government. And uh, uh, if you go to the Department of Revenue and uh, their annual property tax reports and look at, uh, you know, their inventory of the different types of districts and, 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 and the things that we did. Uh, there are, uh, there's an entity that uh, actually still exists in Sangamon County uh, called a Public Building Commission. Uh, when uh, you know, the city of Springfield didn't have uh, that authority, uh, and the library didn't have that authority to build a new library uh, because they couldn't get the referendum passed. Uh, they turned to an entity which uh, uh, has no ability to levy property taxes. It's a countywide entity uh, called a public building commission. Public building commissions, the one thing they can do is issue revenue bonds and build buildings. But the statute provides that uh, if you build a building and enter into a, a, and then lease that building to a unit of local government, the unit of local government can levy a property tax without referendum to uh, pay the debt service on the lease. Uh, and so you essentially had this paper entity issuing revenue bonds, uh, which allowed uh, the levy of a, you know, a, a, the issuing of bond, revenue bonds uh, that were then paid for with a, a property tax levy, which was imposed without, without referendum. Uh, so we went through a lot of different hoops in terms of trying to get a system that worked uh, and uh, uh, you know, there are there are reasons why we have perpetuated uh, the system of local government that exists in Illinois, but the roots of the system go back to how do you deal with urbanization, how do you deal with uh, the need for municipal services, and what are the kinds of limitations that you have, and when the limitations exist within a state constitution, that's much more difficult than when you've got limitations that are basically opposed by, uh, by statute. So, in 1970, the state of Illinois adopted a new constitution. Uh, this is a, you know, if you look in terms of comparative state uh, constitutions, this is a great local government article. Uh, the problem is it was about 100 years too late. Uh, it removed the tax and debt straight jackets from local governments. Uh, it allowed specialist service areas and special assessments and encouraged and facilitated intergovernmental agreements, and it provided home rule powers to municipalities, uh, a, a flat out grant for any municipality of $25,000 or more, and home rule and a mechanism for getting home rule powers for counties. Home rule essentially takes that old idea that uh, local governments are creatures of the state and turn and can only do whatever the state specifically says they can do and turns it on its head. Essentially, home rule 
within some limitations and subject to preemption, uh, says that municipalities uh, can uh, pass ordinances which uh, countermand or in, in stand in, in, in contradiction to state law. Uh, the, one of the first cases uh, under the new home rule powers, the city of Springfield changed the retirement age for firemen, even though there was a statute that specifically set the retirement age at a particular age. And the city just passed an ordinance, and the Supreme Court looked at the home rule powers and said that is, you know, that's a proper use of home rule powers. So home rule municipalities uh, have a wide range of uh, options in terms of providing services and finding revenue sources. The uh, city of Springfield uh, has made a mantra out of keeping its uh, tax, property tax levy at about a, at, at below a dollar for hundred dollars of assessed valuation. Uh, you know, obviously the the amount of the property taxes or the tax base in Illinois has gone up, but we've kept it kept the rate at that level by an ever increasing uh, range of fees and uh, other kinds of taxes in order to uh, provide a broader tax base for the city than uh, it, it, than if you're dealing with basically either uh, you know your rev your property taxes or whatever revenue options are provided by the by the state statute. You also have um, a uh, an art, a language that encourages and facilitates intergovernmental agreements. And so there's a presumption that one can engage in these kinds of agreements. And, uh, you know, municipal attorneys are, uh, by nature, very, very cautious people. And, uh, you know, if the presumption is that, uh, uh, you know, you may if if the if there's a fear that this may not pass, uh, you know, muster in terms of what what uh, the city and and say a, another unit of local government are allowed to do, uh, you're going to get reluctance, uh, uh, you know, and, and caution in terms of engaging these kinds of agreements. Uh, the, eight, the 1970 Constitution essentially green lights the ability of uh, units of local government to engage in uh, intergovernmental agreements involving purchasing, involving uh, 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 you know, gar garages to service uh, uh, individual, uh, you know, uh, cars, uh, uh, fleets, those those sorts of things, and so uh, it's a much friendlier atmosphere that was created, uh, has been created by the the local government article. Um, it's just that you have a uh, hundred years, a hundred plus years of institutionalizing this system of local government that uh, everybody deals with at, uh, at, at this point. Um, now I'm, you know, if, if this were a lecture setting, this would be a perfect point to to, to stop and say, are, are there questions before we we go on to uh, uh, dealing with kind of uh, the where from here in terms of of uh, uh, the, dealing with uh, Illinois system of, of local government? And uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm happy to do that. I'm also in terms of if if people have. Uh, you know, those are things that we can also talk at at, uh, at the end of the discussion. Uh, I'm trying to be conscious of my time here. Okay. Um, so why, if we have such a great uh, local government article and there is, in addition, a lot of pressure on... Um, at the local level to try and, you know, be more efficient, be more effective. Uh, you know, there's a lot of concern about how high property taxes are. And while a majority of that pressure comes from 
taxes involving schools and the, the only realistic way to relieve that part of the pressure is going to be you know swapping local property taxes for state funding uh, you know there is there is a lot of concern about the cost of local government. There's a lot of there's a lot of fiscal pressure in terms of local economies and the state economies. It is clear that help is not coming from the federal government. It's not coming from the state. So you know we have to address these locally. But there are a number of things that make it difficult in terms of uh, you know getting saying, you know, how can we bring fresh eyes to this? Uh, the institutional inertia of just this is the way we've always done things. This is how we go about getting services. This is about how we provide things. Uh, you know, we've always had uh, a fire protection district with a basically local fire department. Uh, and so uh, if we're talking about the fact that we can't uh, you know, we don't have the volunteers anymore. Uh, we've got problems with, uh, you know, keeping uh, equipment up to date. Uh, we've got response times problems, uh, you know, and, you know, should we be thinking about regional arrangements? Should we be thinking about, you know, some different way of organizing fire protection in the rural parts of the county? Uh, you know, it's difficult to get beyond this is kind of the way that we've always done it. Um, there's no question that uh, there are partisan dimensions to maintaining the current system of local government. Uh, some of it is Democrat and Republican. Some of it is just about uh, uh, the the fact that uh, these are political entities and you know that are. Uh, where control is settled uh, is established through people running for office and, and winning elections. Uh, there was a time in which uh, the movement to, for instance, abolish townships had a lot of momentum uh, in the early 60s uh, and in, in the mid 60s and, and in Illinois. And uh, uh, you know, the city of Chicago used to not be a, uh, uh, and the Cook County Democrats didn't used to be a huge fan of, ta of townships. Uh, then you got revenue sharing uh, under the Nixon administration, which decided that uh, townships were units of local government, just like counties and municipalities, and so townships got revenue sharing money. And then you got which revitalized townships in in suburban uh, in suburban areas in terms of you know we've got money and what are we going to do with it and you know and and townships started to get into social service areas uh, that they had not uh, done historically and then the demographic political demographics changed and all of a sudden uh, you know Cook County rather than being a rib rock you know kind of uh, bastion of, of Republican voters uh, went from being, uh, uh, you know, to a competitive situation to a situation now where, uh, uh, you know, suburban Cook is uh, solidly in the in the Democratic, uh, uh, you know, uh, side of the ledger, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, townships are a nice way to uh, structure political organizations uh, uh, within uh, within the suburbs, and and so townships then became uh, you know became even more attractive in terms of uh, you know the, the partisan status quo. Uh, uh, so there are you know there are there are partisan benefits. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, you didn't, you know, you didn't develop the structures to provide partisan advantage, but given the nature of Illinois part of politics, uh, people have found ways to, uh, you know, use the structure in terms of partisan advantage. Uh, you know, this has always been a a, a heavily patronage state, uh, at, at, at least, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, from from the the early uh, 19th century. Uh, uh, and so uh, that's a, that's a, a side of it. Uh, 
Now, the desire for local control and local autonomy is always there, and these are the trade-offs. The city of Springfield has four municipalities that are completely surrounded, uh, you know, they're hole-in-the-donut kinds of, of municipalities. Uh, it doesn't make any sense at all for them to exist and be providing municipal services if we're talking about economies of scale. But the idea, you know, it would be very, would be very difficult to get the people in Grandview and Southern View and, you know, if you in Jerome, if you know Springfield, uh, the idea that they should suddenly become, uh, you know, uh, no longer be in a separate municipality and become part of the city of Springfield, uh, you know, that is something that you're always dealing with. Uh, uh, trying, you know, you're always dealing with that desire for local control and local autonomy, which is a very positive thing. But you know, there are always trade-offs there. Uh, state mandates uh, certainly have an impact on, uh, you know, how much, you know, what you're required to do, how much you can spend. Uh, one of the things that we found in dealing with Sangamon County is just a not a lot of local you know communication uh, between municipalities between fire protection districts uh, this is not something that uh, it's easy to get people to take up uh, the push for the citizens efficiency commission came from a group outside of uh, you know that went to the county board and said you know can we get a an, an entity, can we get a task force going that can kind of look at all of this? Uh, there are failures at the state level, uh, including we haven't implemented the local government article, and you know there certainly was a possibility of the Department of Local Government Affairs to play a positive function within uh, the way local government operates and the way it's organized. Uh, but that was lost in, in uh, the way that that was rolled out in the early 70s. Uh, uh, you know, a, another problem within, uh, you know, uh, within the Walker administration, particularly. And so uh, we've never had the kind of uh, institutional arrangement at the state level to deal with this. And then uh, the demographic changes. Uh, you know, the big sort has been taking place in terms of economic segregation, racial, racial resegregation, uh, depending on the part of the state that you're in. So we've got more polarization, more isolation, and then a lack of data and analysis. Uh, you know, one of the things that we found in terms of looking at municipal services within Sangamon County is it's very, very difficult to get any kind of hard data in terms of what's actually being provided and getting some kind of sense of what comparative costs are. Uh, and so if you don't have resources committed to providing you, to getting you a baseline, very difficult to make decisions. Okay, all of that is reasonably depressing, but uh, I wouldn't want for a minute to suggest that there are, you know, we're just kind of helpless in terms of dealing with this. Um, you know, there, there is a role to be played at the state. Now, we're going to get, we get these kind of feel-good solutions that are basically rearranging the furniture uh, or squeezing the beast. Uh, you know, if we just cut the amount of money that local units of local government have available, then they'll sort it out. And uh, because we, we just, you know, there's X amount of waste out there and we just have to force people to deal with it. Or, uh, you know, we can uh, take uh, school districts and, you know, we can combine things at the district level without combining schools, without combining actual school buildings, and that'll save some administrative costs, but it doesn't really, you know, won't really get at the pro the issue of, you know, how big of an entity, you know, how do you provide services to uh, 
educational services in rural areas in terms of small schools. Uh, there's no question that mandate relief is important in terms of dealing with you know, the legislature imposing things from above. Uh, I have, you know, I mean, I like the idea that the legislature has just mandated you know, school districts to provide an element of civics education. Uh, but, uh, you know, how that, you know, can, is that going to require additional costs? Uh, beyond, you know, there's certainly a cost in terms of changing one's your know, curriculum and, and emphasis, but, you know, are there costs beyond that? You know, are, you know, how do you make the trade off between the state as the big school board, in this case, making, uh, kind of judgments about what ought to be provided, uh, and, uh, the, the desire and the, the positive benefits from local control and the ability to work things out at the local level. Uh, certainly implementing the local government article, changing state law in terms of dissolving and combining uh, units of local government, uh, you know, empowering units of local government and citizens to make changes. Uh, you know, the best way, you know, if, if, if you don't want to abolish townships, then uh, the best way to prevent that is to make sure that there's no state law that allows you to abolish townships. You know, I'm not you know, whether you know, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but uh, so certainly there's a role for the state to play in terms of empowering the, the, the local local units of government, local citizens. Now, I think the the way to deal with this in terms of making a difference in the lives of citizens at the local level is through local initiatives. And, uh, you know, if you go online and look under Sangamon County, you can find the task force report for the Citizens Efficiency Commission. I'm not holding it up as the only way the or even the best way to go about this, but what you got was a group of citizens that went to the county board that said, you know, let's set up a task force, a commission that has representatives of all the different units of local government in the county. Let's get people appointed to that and let's give them resources in terms of staff from the, the city county planning commission so that the group can sit down and study, uh, you know, fire protection and emerg emerg emer <laughs> emergency medical services in rural areas. What's out there? What's being provided? What are the response times? What are the difficulties? How is the change in volunteerism affecting the, the ability to staff fire protection districts? And to then, you know, identify problems, get a base, get some data and try to start making some recommendations. Uh, actually, Springfield, Sangamon County have been reasonably progressive in this area. You know, we have turned all of the public health over to the county, county health department. The city of Springfield turned all of the recreation over to uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, park district, so no longer recreation services being provided by the city or the county. Uh, we no longer have, uh, you know, parks that are being mowed by three different units of local government, depending on, on you know, who owned the particular land. Uh, we abolished this, the, uh, saying the Springfield Election Commission. Uh, you know, there are things that, you know, that, that we've done in the county. There are things that we could do. But, you know, when you look at where you're spending money, you know, you're spending money on police and fire. You know, those are, you know, personnel is your biggest cost. Uh, you're not going to be able to solve pensions at the local level. Uh, I don't think the General Assembly is going to abolish collective bargaining at the local level. You know, there are limits as to what you can do at the, at the local level. But intergovernmental cooperation agreements are 
fantastic ways to go about dealing with these problems without uh, dissolving uh, you know, units of local government without uh, going through either the legal or the political uh, fights that are often necessary. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do this. And in, in so single unit, multifunction consolidation, those are all things that uh, you know that that need to be considered, and when if you dissolve units of local government and transfer their functions, you know that all this has to be done with an idea towards uh, uh, making sure that uh, you're matching resources up with needs. Um, if you want to talk about looking at local government just from the perspective of economies of scale, efficiency and effectiveness, and uh, you want to set aside for a minute uh, you know, how you exercise uh, citizen input and local control, then you, know, you can point to uh, some really interesting examples of uh, you know, countywide government, metro government uh, that have been instituted in in a in a number of places throughout the country, but uh, you know you are talking about going up against the institutional inertia, the political inertia, and the trade offs in terms of local control. If you've got a, an experience of the county providing services and customizing services for local communities, and you've been doing that for uh, you know 75 years, 50 years, 100 years, whatever it happens to be. Uh, you know those things look attractive from the outside. The uh, the the issue is when you get to dealing with a particular area. And, and again, you know, Sangamon County is with a you know a hundred thousand city, you know, hundred and ten thousand people in Springfield, a hundred and eighty, ninety thousand people uh, countywide, uh, you know, one other large municipality. You know, that's a reasonable kind of entity to be thinking about you know, what are things we can do regionally? What are things, are there ways to organize things that make sense? Uh, in a very rural county, it's a very different set of circumstances. If we're talking about an urban, basically an urban county or a county that, you know, has gone through tremendous urbanization in the last 20 years, then you're, you're faced with a different set of circumstances. This has to be something that is done at the local level. Local buy-in, manageable tasks, getting people used to the idea that uh, we can do things, that we can talk, we can communicate, we can find ways to save money uh, and you know get better services or the same services at lower costs that we can meet needs and also deal with questions of being responsive uh, to, to citizen demands and the need to provide services in, 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 in ways that are cost effective that, that manage the, the, the dollars that come from taxpayers, the dollars that come from the state. So this is not an easy thing to deal with. Uh, and it can seem overwhelming if you just kind of, you know, sit there and look at it uh, and, and look at all of what's out there. But clearly this is something that, uh, you know, there's both an opportunity and there's a huge need to do this because of the pressure that is on local governments and that's just going to, com you know, going to increase. And, you know, you can get some help from the state in terms of facilitating it, but you really have to sit down and approach this, you know, from uh, from the perspective of uh, you know the local community 
uh, whether it's you know a county, whether it's a township, whatever you know, in a, in a larger urban county, you know, whatever's the manifold unit, uh, you know, it has to be. It's got to be something that where you can get a start, and it's got to be something where you get buy-in, not only from local officials but also from the citizens within the community. And I'm going to stop at that point and see, you know, I actually ran a little longer than I thought. But I'm happy to, to respond to any questions that, that people have uh, or might have at this point. Well, thank you, Dr. Redfield. Uh, does anyone have any questions? If you do, please go ahead and put them into the um, chat box for us. Okay, uh, Dr. Redfield, here's your first question. <laughs> Do you expect control at the county level to become a common initiative in the coming years? A com I, I think he means a common initiative in the initiative. Yep. Um, home rule. <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, I, I think that's something that people should explore. The problem with home rule counties, with with talking about home rule, is what frightens everybody is that it, there are the lack of limitations on property taxes. And so it becomes a matter of trust. What you have found in home rule municipalities is that home rule municipalities have gone out of their way to find other sources of revenue other than property taxes to fund initiatives. Uh, and to keep property taxes low. You know, city councils and mayors have to get reelected. If you can raise revenue through licensing, through regulation, if you can raise revenue through hotel motel tax or sales tax, uh, and not do something that shows up on citizens' property tax bills, that's the way that you go, you know, that, that, that's been the pattern of the use of home rule powers. But uh, there is, you know, uh, unfortunately, well, I don't know. I, I, you know, the only example of home rule county in Illinois, uh, which one that became automatically home rule, is Cook County. And uh, there is a, uh, a reluctance, uh, I would guess I would, the way I would characterize it, uh, in lots of parts of the state to emulate things that are going on uh, in the city of Chicago or, or Cook County. But by and large, the experience with home rule has been very, very positive. Uh, and in terms of limiting pr uh, property tax uh, increases, uh, again, uh, as I as I remember the local gov the article there, uh, it is talking about uh, you know uh, you would have to do that through a constitutional amendment is is a, is you know and I may have to to give you a better answer than that, but I think that's probably the case that 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 you would have to uh, uh, that that could be only be imposed. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, it could. I'm saying this poorly. You can limit property taxes if you do it with a three-fifths vote statutorily uh, beyond the, you know, in, 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 in terms of home rule units. So, yes, there is a, you can, you can, you can limit it, but it has to be preemption. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. That would be a three-fifths vote. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, if not, as I mentioned, you will be getting a follow-up email about the survey and, and taking the survey. And in that email, we will put Dr. Redfield's uh, email address if you have any further questions for him. Excellent, Dr. Redfield. We really appreciated your time. And we'd also like to just mention that next month, our June webinar uh, is going to be on the Open Meetings Act. And uh, you'll soon be getting emails about that, or you can go out on our website uh, and register for it. It will be our last webinar, and we will start again then in September. We'll be taking July and August off. Um, and Kathy's saying thank you for a very informative presentation, Dr. Redfield. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll sign off then, and we'll stop recording. <laughs>